today I'll be uh, sharing with you guys some information about uh, growing foods if you're a raw foodist. But before I get into this, I want to let you guys know why I'm so passionate about growing food these days, and uh, which basically takes me back onto you know why I get in, got into raw foods. I mean, the only reason why I'm here today is because I had a life-threatening illness when I was younger. I almost lost my life. I was hospitalized with spinal meningitis, and for many of you guys know how serious that can be. I was put in the hospital, and uh, the doctors told me that I might not make it out alive. Now, that's not a fun place to be, uh, especially when you're in your 20s, or at any age, but especially in your 20s when I um, just graduated college and I have my whole life ahead of me. And I really thought long and hard when I was in the hospital, like, John, what's really important? Like, even if you had that nice, fancy car you wanted, or, you know, a lot of money, a million dollars, like, what good would that stuff, that stuff, do for you right now at this point in time like it wouldn't do anything I mean I could lose my life and you could leave the car and leave the money for whatever happens to it I don't, it wouldn't even matter so I really learned at a young age thankfully that your health is your greatest wealth and I know many of you guys may have heard that saying before and yeah it goes in one ear and goes out the other but seriously you mean your health is your greatest wealth because if you don't have your health you can't enjoy the money you can't enjoy a car you can't enjoy your family you can't en enjoy community, you can't enjoy food, you can't enjoy anything in life. And so at that point, you know, luckily I didn't get through that situation with raw foods. I can only say I got through that situation from higher powers because the doctors gave me the best, you know, treatment they could, which didn't even guarantee my results. So even if I had all the money, I couldn't write a check, Mr. Doctor, one million dollars, do not cash unless John walks out of here. So, you know, and millionaires, trillionaires, gazillionaires lose their lives every day. And all the money in the world is not going to save it if they're not being proactive with their health and taking care of their health by, you know, eating a natural plant-based diet. So, I was really motivated after I got out of the hospital to do something different because upon leaving the hospital, the doctor said well, the reason why I was put in the hospital or why I got this disease is that I had what's called complement immune deficiency, which is basically a compromised immune system, uh, and they, which they blamed on defective genes. So basically, like many of you guys may have seen the Boy in the Bubble movie back in the 70s, Ooh. but that was the extreme, right? Like, that guy had to live in the bubble. You guys, normal people, are maybe here. I'm not like the guy in the bubble, but I'm maybe more somewhere in the middle. I'm not like a standard person that could fight off all the different things happening there, because we all have immune systems. So I needed to do something different, and that's when I learned about juicing through Jay Cordage. He talked about juicing on an infomercial I saw back in the 90s, and uh, how it could build your immune system. And then with his uh, program, I got six to set tapes. He talked about raw foods, which actually at the time I poo-pooed and thought he was a crazy nut job for <laughs> saying, you know, the one thing that prematurely ages you is cooked foods. Don't put cooked foods in your body. When I originally heard him say that, I'm like, this guy's a freaking whack job. Everybody I know eats cooked foods. My grade school teachers, I mean, I don't know anybody that's a raw foodist. I mean, this was back in the 90s. I mean, we, this is a different time now when I, than when I got into it. And so it was really kind of weird and whacked out, and I didn't want to accept that. But I accepted the juicing as my first introductory step into the world of eating more fruits and vegetables. And it was great, and I felt different. So then, you know, that led me to cleansing and then, you know, into raw foods and I just had to just go for it because I wanted to live. And, uh, you know, so, and the other thing about me is that since that time, I've really strived to always better what I'm doing. I live by a principle called Kanai. In Japanese, it's called Kaizen. It's a C-A-N-I, -C stands for constant and never-ending improvement. So this is like a technique that, uh, Deming, which is an American businessman, after World War II went over to Japan and gave the Japanese businesses like Sony, Honda, and Toyota um, a technique by basically when you make a car, don't just make the car and then you're done making the car and now you just sell the car and keep selling cars because they keep selling. You want to like analyze each process when making the car, whether it's you know you're molding the sheet metal for the door or whether you're you know doing something for the trunk and how it closes, if it latches, if it lines up every single time you make one, and if it's off a millimeter, millimeter, you could always improve it. And that's why I believe, you know, like things like uh, Toyotas and Honda cars, like they just go forever as long as you change the oil and take care of them. You know, unlike American cars that seem to always be breaking down, fix or repair daily. <laughs> so, you know, I also live my life by trying to always improve what I'm doing. So like I was already eating a raw foods diet 
And then, you know, more recently, I'm like, okay, John, you're eating the best things. You're eating a diet mostly consisting of fruits and vegetables. How could you improve your diet? Because there has to be a way. I will never stop at just like being happy and content with where I am because I know there's always better. Even if it's just that much better, it's still an improvement. I know many of you guys in here may eat a little bit of raw or a lot raw, but you know, I always encourage everybody to eat a little bit more fruits and vegetables. You know, even if you eat only one apple a day and that's all the raw foods you eat, if you eat two apples a day, that's doubling your raw food intake. That's great, and it, one apple doesn't sound like much. But if you do that consistently over a year, what? Then you're eating 365 apples in, in one day at the end of the year. Well, maybe not that many. But you guys get my, you guys get my point. You're just going to, you know, if you continually just make small improvements, small improvements over a long period of time is an incremental improvement in the long run. So I've been leading my life by trying to always improve what I'm doing. And I'm like, I'm already eating a pretty good raw diet. How can I improve it? Well, then I started being concerned about the food quality that I'm eating. So instead of just getting, you know, uh, industrial foods from the farmer from the grocery store then I went to like getting organic foods you know at the health food store because yeah organic in most cases but not always is a big improvement above conventional foods <clears throat> then I'm like okay well maybe I could do better we could go to the local farmers market and buy from a farmer so it's not being trucked and shipped all over and then I'm like then I wasn't even happy there and it's kind of sucks that I'm always never happy you know? maybe that's why I'm still single but um, <laughs> That's a whole other story. But anyway, we're not going there today. <laughs> so anyway, so anyways, like I'm like, okay, John, how can you make the food that you're getting local, organic from the farmers even better? Well, I had a friend, Don Weaver, he's still my friend. Um, he talked about growing food at home using rock dust because of most standard agriculture, they put like you know NPK fertilizer, which are three minerals out of a spectrum of over 100 minerals on the periodic table of the elements. And uh, you know, most farming is done this way, whether it's organic or conventional. They're mainly concerned with three minerals, and in some cases, maybe, I don't know, 16 or 18, but definitely under 20 for most standard farming or agriculture where there's business and trade involved. But I learned about adding like 70 plus different minerals, including trace minerals, into the soil to have healthier plants. And how I could relate this is we all know if you eat a diet of like McDonald's or junk foods, right? You're not going to be so healthy. You may be overweight, you're probably going to be sick all the time, and it will catch up to you over time. So the health of us depends on what we eat. Well, it's the same thing with the plants. If we put in like, you know, uh, three minerals, the plants are getting certain nutrients, and yes, they'll live, they'll thrive, they'll make food, but they're not going to be as healthy as if they had a full spectrum of the different minerals and other things that are in the soil. So when I started growing in this method that I use today, uh, number one, the food just tasted better. Like I'll taste, I do taste tests still. And I just actually did a taste test with my assistant and I brought back some celerac or the celery root, whatever. And she made some kind of, uh, I don't know, mashed potatoes out of the celery root, some recipe that's online. And she's like, wow, man, that's really good. And she's like, I want to get more of that. But I, was, I had harvested all, this, all the celery root that I had, so I went down to Whole Foods and got the organic celery root, brought it home. She made the same exact recipe. And she's like, this doesn't taste good. And I'm like, I told you all my stuff tastes really good. But I mean, the flavors really intensify when you add more nutrition or add more minerals in there. I mean, the flavors really come out. I mean, we know that we have sugar receptors and salt receptors on our tongue, but we also have mineral receptors on our tongue. And it really lights us up and makes us feel good when we eat good food. Like I'll grow lemon cucumbers. And lemon cucumbers, are, they don't have a bitter skin like the standard cucumber, but they're not necessarily a sweet fruit by any means. And I'm not going to say mine are really sweet, but I can't say I've tasted lemon cucumbers just, you know, fresh pick at the farmer's market or even when I'm visiting farms have their cucumbers, I'm like, oh, that's all right. But then when I have mine, you can really taste, like, the flavors and the sweetness. And it just, it just tastes so much better. And, like, and it's kind of, like, getting spoiled these days of, like, just the, like, really good food. And then when I go somewhere and I'm just buying other stuff, it's just not the same. So that's why I got into growing my own food, you know. So I got into raw foods because I needed to. I started growing my own food to increase and better what I'm doing. And it's important to grow your own food for many reasons. Number one... I don't know, where you guys all live in like in the west coast, of, who, who lives from the midwest or east coast or somewhere other than 
the west coast of California. So Chicago. Chicago, right. So yeah, so in California, we're pretty lucky. Produce prices are pretty cheap, but I've tra I travel a bit, you know, and in Chicago or South Florida where I travel, I mean, like organic greens, sometimes they'll be like $5 a pound. I mean, here in California, you could get like an organic like lettuce for maybe, I don't know, buck, buck 50, maybe two bucks when they're like really expensive. But some places, they're quite expensive. And you, you could save a lot of money by growing your own food at home. Now, if it was just for saving money, I don't know if I'd be uh, growing my own food because I do spend quite a bit of money and invest a lot of money into my garden to grow high quality food. That's not the only reason for me. The other reason is the quality of the food. You know, you gotta think like in our standard agriculture system, if you're buying things at Whole Foods or the grocery store, they grow things in monoculture. So they have a field of just the lettuce. They clear cut all the lettuce. You know, it gets uh, hydro cooled, put in a truck, cooled down almost to freezing temperatures to cool, lock in the freshness. Then it goes, you know, in a cold storage place, and then it goes from the cold storage place on a truck to the distributor, and then it goes from the distributor to, you know, your store. And then it might sit in the back of the store for a couple days before they actually restock it and put it out. So depending on where you live, once again, if you're in the West Coast, you're luckier than people living on the East Coast because a lot of the produce is grown in California. Produce could be, I don't know, a week to, you know, months old. In the case of apples that you're buying today, those are apples that are harvested last year when it was the end of apple season. And one of the things I've learned is that over time, you know, produce, after it's been cut, picked, whatever, and, and shipped, it decreases in nutrition. So within 24 hours of harvest of, say, broccoli, 50% of certain nutrients can be lost. Now, I'm not saying like, oh, the stuff at Whole Foods that you're buying, the produce is worthless. No, I'm saying if that's the best you can do, that's great, but wouldn't you want to have you know, a higher level of nutrition just by simply going out to your garden and picking it? You're going to have 50% of more nutrients just because as soon as something's picked, it's start, not starting to on it, go work its way out. You know, It's starting to not live anymore and things decrease. But not only is there that uh, deduction, the other deduction is if the plant's not fully nourished as a plant when it's growing and not giving everything it needs, like all the different minerals and trace elements and all this kind of stuff, then it's not going to be as nutritious. So I have a tool I like to use, it's called the Brix meter, which you could, which is B-R-I-X, and it's a refractometer, 0 to 32 refractometer, I have videos on this. And on the handout I did put my uh, three or four websites on here. On Growing Your Greens, I have uh, 900 videos, and that's the main way I do the presentations now. I have like videos on the bricks meter, how to use it. It was a funny story, like, I used it because I went to the farmer's market to buy my watermelons, because I like to buy local whenever possible instead of like going to Whole Foods. And I got a watermelon, and the lady at the farmer's market is telling me, this is the best watermelon you've ever tasted. And I was like, man, I've heard that before. <laughs> And so I bought it, I'm like, okay, and then I bought that one, and then I went to another farmer's market and met another guy. He didn't say it was the best I ever tasted, but he says, yeah, we use soil humates, which is actually a, generally a good thing to add to your soil and adds minerals to your soil. I'm like, okay, that's going to be a good watermelon. And then I bought one from Whole Foods. So then in one of my videos, I actually uh, cut open the watermelons, and I test each one on my refractometer to show, like, how good they are, because there's a, there's a chart. You could download a chart, a standard refractometer index chart, like if... If you look through this little thing, it looks like a te telescope that the pirates used to look through. But you got to put it up through the light, and then you see a little gradient scale, like a bar graph, and it goes 0 to 32. And on the scale, like, I'm making up numbers here because I don't know the numbers for watermelon, but like a, a poor one would be uh, 6, a good one would be 8, an average one would be 10, and an excellent watermelon would be 14. And like all the ones that I tested were like below average. Like the one that the lady said, oh, this is the best watermelon you taste. And I'm like, man, maybe she hasn't tasted good watermelon. <laughs> and it, it just kind of like really kind of made me sad that, you know, this is the farming system we, we deal with because a farming system is not set up to create high quality food. It's, it's set up to create a high volume or poundage of food because the farmers get paid on the poundage by the piece. Right? I think a farming system should be designed by the quality of the food. You know, I would gladly pay double for food that I could verify has double the nutrition and has more antioxidants, phytochemicals and phytonutrients, which to me are even more important than just simply calories that many people may be focusing on this day and age. So yeah, but, but besides, if you don't want to get that refractometer thing and all this stuff, you know, our taste buds are the best judge if something tastes good or not. You know, we've all had, hopefully we've all had that homegrown tomato or 
farmer's market tomato, and we know what that tastes like compared to the ones we're getting at the store right now that are being imported and that are still pink, right? So yeah, the quality is, uh, can vary highly. Another thing that's very important with homegrown things, once again, the nutrition. So if, for example, another example I could give is if growing in the proper nutrition in your soil, the produce that you're growing, for, like on green beans, for example, you could get store-bought green beans, I've seen a study on, or you grow green beans in your home, you know, using good soil practices and good growing techniques, because I'm not just saying grow it in your home and you're going to have the highest quality stuff. No, you have to work on it. Um, it could have 50% more protein in the green bean, 50% more of other minerals. So now, guess what? If you're growing food that has, you know, double the protein, double the nu nutrients on some nutrients, I'm not saying everything, and other, other things are definitely increased, guess what? You could eat half as much food to get the same amount of nutrition. You don't have to keep eating stuff because we're eating deficient food and that's our, that our food system is creating this day and age. So another thing is uh, really important to me on why to grow your own food is the varieties. I mean, we have an illusion that when we go to the grocery store or Whole Foods, oh yeah, we have this great huge selection. They got this huge produce section and they have 300 different produce items that we could select from today. I mean, 300 produce items, that sounds like a lot, but in the scope of things, what's it, it, compared to what is in nature and the varieties out there, I mean, there's over a thousand varieties of just mangoes alone. I barely had maybe 30 varieties of mangoes. I've eaten over 100 varieties of apples, and they each taste different. You go to the store, you might be able to find one or, well, you can find maybe a handful of varieties of mangoes. If you go to the store, you can maybe get, well, maybe a dozen varieties of apples if you're lucky. But I mean, I've been to like rare fruit grower apple tastings where they have a hundred apples lined up and you get to taste every one and they each taste so different and unique. Some suck, <laughs> some are really good, <laughs> you know, but that's just what it is. But one, the apple that I like might be the one that you think sucks and you'll like one that I don't like. But it's like this genetic diversity that's super important. Now, besides just the ge genetic diversity within the crops, there's totally different crops that people are just not exposed to. Many people have eaten water spinach or Kang Kong. Oh, cool, well, you guys are cool. Three, a couple, all Asian people maybe. But there's so many different foods that, you know, in general are not sold in trade because they do not store a ship well. Here's something to really consider that's kind of interesting. Like, when you go to the store to buy like vegetables, like leafy greens, right? Those leafy greens that you're buying in general are leafy greens that'll do good and grow well in the winter time. Why? Anybody know why? Cold weather. Because of the sun. Why do the leafy greens that you buy, that you buy in the store, do well in the winter time? Or because they'll do good in the winter time when it's cold, but also that means they can be cut and be put into refrigeration and also keep well. Mm. Right. So a lot of the food system that were set up and that we could buy for things from the store are foods that would do well in the cold weather. So that they could they could last long, so they could store longer without going bad. So the farmers and the companies do not lose their profits. It's very rare to find go to the store. I don't know if I've ever found go to the store to find Malvar spinach, which is a tropical green that once you cut within like I don't know half hour or something, it starts to wilt. I mean, it's not, and you're not going to be able to find it in the store. So you're going to get a much wider variety of things that you can eat if you grow your own food and grow it fresh because some things just can't be stored and shipped and it's not financially viable for the companies to do it. And I think this is really sad because I've, I've opened my eyes to a lot of different edible greens, whether they're you know, ones from other countries, ones that I've researched, uh, nutritionally dense, herbaceous, leafy greens that money can't buy. I mean, maybe you could buy it in powders, like a big thing now is the Moringa powder. And you could buy a Moringa powder downstairs in one of the booths for, I don't know, I don't know what they sell, for $40 a pound for dried Moringa. Or if you live in Southern California where you don't get any frost, you could plant a seed and have a Moringa tree and just pick your leaves off the tree, like, and it grows year round like a weed. It, it'll grow so big, you have to cut it down and, like, control its growth. And you have so many leaves, you just can't eat them all. And then, besides just getting the moringa, you get the nutrients in the moringa, plus you're getting it fresh with the water content, because I always encourage everybody to eat fresh foods instead of dried foods whenever possible. Now, will I eat some moringa at a pinch when I don't have anything I want on an airplane? Yeah, of course, because I can't have fresh moringa, because it wills pretty fast. That's another one that you can't really buy in the store too much either. So you can get a much wider variety. Also, another reason for growing your own food is convenience. So I'd much rather open my front door, take two steps outside, and start 
picking my lettuce and eating it instead of having to like get in the car, go two miles to the store, or walk, you know, to the store. So much easier to like go outside, right? Also, it's more ecological, environmentally friendly too to grow your own. So that's why, hopefully I've convinced you at least a little bit to nudge you in the direction of like, yeah, John, it's, I agree with you, it's totally important to grow your own food because of the reasons. And so now we want to get into what are the best foods to grow? How many people are already growing food that are in this room now? Wow, I mean, I should just leave, you guys are all right. That's great. Um, but the best foods to grow as a raw food is, right? Because I think for, for reals, you know, if you're into raw food, you should definitely be growing you know, at least some of your own food. You don't have to grow all of it, because you know, it, it, you get like, it's just like when you first went raw, if you tried to go all raw or nothing, right? It just doesn't happen. Like, I'm gonna grow all my own foods or just not even try. No, once again, we wanna make small incremental uh, changes. If you don't, haven't grown anything before, that's all, all right. Get a little container, grow it in your kitchen window and just, you know, water it once in a while. Start out by having a little container garden or start with a four foot by four foot raised bed. I mean, I have, a lot of area that I have to plant out, but you don't need to have some big thing like me. Just get your feet wet, you know? When, when I jump in a pool, I hate, like, jumping in the pool. I'd, you know, I like to just tiptoe in a little bit of time, you know? So the water that gets to my areas that makes it feel funny, I still don't like that, right? So I like to go a little bit slower. So if you're growing stuff or eating more raw food, just do it slowly. But the best foods to grow by far are the leafy green vegetables. Why are leafy green vegetables so important? Number one, they're a really quick turnaround. You can plant the seeds of leafy greens as soon as the plant comes up, and as soon as there's greens on there, you can pick them and eat them. For example, if we took tomatoes and we planted a tomato plant, you could grow the tomato, and then all of a sudden it would make all the leaves of the tomato, and you can't really eat the tomato leaves. They're not good to eat. But then you've got to wait for it to make the flowers, and then the flowers have to turn into the fruits, and then the fruits have to ripen, and then you can finally eat them. It takes a lot longer than the leafy greens. Plus, the leafy greens, you know, uh, generally cost more money. They definitely cost a lot more money than, you know, tomatoes or other things that you could grow, in my opinion. Plus, they're more nutrient dense. How many people are familiar with the concept of nutrient density? Wow, a handful. Well, actually, more than a handful. Um, so, nutrient density, what that means is it has a lot of phytochemicals, phytonutrients, and vitamin minerals as compared to the amount of calories it has. So, as we know, the standard American junk food diet is really high in calories, low in nutrition. Leafy greens are the exact opposite. I mean, my channel is called Growing Your Greens, because greens is what I found is the most powerful food. It has high protein, a lot of different nutrients in there, and low calories. And it's going to keep you real healthy. I mean, there's different compounds in the leafy greens, like the broccoli and the allium or the cruciferous and uh, onion and garlic family that are anti-cancerous. So these... All these different greens have different phytonutrients that can probably protect us from different diseases if you want to stay healthy and be healthy. Um, another thing I find is that uh, greens are probably one of the most under-eaten foods in a raw foods diet. Yeah, it's, it's easy to eat cacao balls and chocolate balls because they taste good, right? <laughs> Even fresh fruits, yeah, they taste great too. Not maybe compared to cacao and chocolate balls. <laughs> but, Greens are just get the bad rap. They just really get passed over many times because people don't like to eat their greens. But let me tell you, if you grow your greens properly, they're going to taste so sweet. I mean, I was in my garden just picking greens when I was gardening the other day. And I was like, wow, how can greens taste this good? <laughs> it was sad. <laughs> I mean, they're really good. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> and they take little space too. I mean, if, even if you don't have a lot of space, you can't grow like a big fruit tree that's gonna be massive, right? Greens take up little space. One of my favorite uh, greens to grow is called tree collards. And especially if you live, live here in Southern California, you definitely wanna have some tree collards. This is a plant that grows as a tree. You can grow up a little stalk and make sure you train it well. And it grows like a little tree and it just has leaves. And it grows these leaves 365 days a year as a tree. And, the tallest ones I've grown are like 14 feet tall. You probably want to prune it before it gets that tall so you can harvest them. And every single day you'll be able to eat leaves off of it. And, you know, get a little patch of tree collards. They're low maintenance because you don't have to keep replanting them like you do with many common vegetables. Like you plant lettuce, you can plant lettuce once and then, you know, after several months it, you have to start over because it goes through its life cycle. The tree collards continually live day after day, year after year, making 
food for you to eat. And they're the, by far the easiest plant. So even if you have a patio in a, a condominium or apartment, you could just have a pot on your balcony of the tree collards. And maybe have, I'd probably have like three tree collard plants in like one big half a wine barrel. And that provides you a good amount of food. I mean, I've, I've turned many people on to tree collards. And they're one of my favorites. The, I've, I've learned the green one's a little more hardy than the purple one, but the purple one tastes a lot better than the green one. The greens, growing the greens will save you the most money by far because they can get quite expensive. And it may actually start you to get liking your greens because they will taste better than the stuff you get at the store. Um, another food to grow as a raw foodist, I believe, are the sprouts and the microgreens. Why? Well, number one, because even if you don't have a yard, you can grow sprouts and you can grow microgreens inside, number one. Number two, if you go to buy sprouts or microgreens, they're actually quite expensive. I mean, just, uh, I don't know, two ounces of microgreens are, I don't know, five dollars or something ridiculous. And they're so easy to grow, and I have videos, uh, you know, where I've uh, visited uh, commercial uh, businesses that grow these on large scale to sell to people that they have been doing it successfully for many years and I go into their businesses and I I show exactly what they're doing so that you could do it too at home and it's relatively uh, you know cheap to buy some seeds and some starting trays to grow some of your own microgreens and sprouts plus the microgreens and sprouts actually have higher levels of nutrition than even the adult vegetables and they take less space and also they have a much more tender and a delectable flavor for many people that may not like their greens. And you don't need too much, like with the garden you might need to buy the soil, you know, I might need to buy, you know, the hoses, the hose, the shovels, the rock dust powders. With the microgreens and the sprouts you need to buy the seeds, maybe a couple of jars, maybe a couple of trays, and I'd probably get some, uh, some seawater mineral product to add the minerals back into those guys when you're growing them, and that's it. Another best food to grow are uncommon foods that you want to eat. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but there's so many different greens that I grow now that I just money cannot buy. So one of those is called ashitaba. How many people are familiar with ashitaba? Ashitaba is called Angelica Keith case. So it's a special kind of Angelica from Hashijo Island in Japan. Where do you get the seeds? Uh, so yeah. horizonherbs.com, I believe, has its seeds. I also have a video on the ashitaba where I get into this more. How do you spell it? A-S-H-I-T-A-B-A. -A. But the ashitaba is a special kind of angelica, and when you, when you cut the plant, it oozes, like, yellow. And I have a really good video of this. It, like, bleeds yellow. <laughs> and this yellow stuff is called, known as chalconed, and this is very powerful antioxidant and, and healing uh, properties contained within it. And normally you could get ashitaba in a powder at the health food store, but you know, why buy powders when you can't grow it fresh? Mm -hmm. So I started growing it fresh and it's, it's a really cool plant. I love it a, a lot and you know, I wouldn't probably be buying ashitaba powder because that's like $200 a pound, you know, dried. So I mean, this is a really valuable plant. I mean, another one I grow, let's see, besides the ashitaba, I mean, there's, oh, there's so many, like New Zealand spinach is another one that's really nice, not quite as medicinal as the ashitaba. I mean, there's so many different ones that now you can eat if you grow them that you would not be able to buy. And that's what I like about my videos. When I make my videos, you know, I'll, I'll show some of these uncommon things to let people know and create awareness about them. I mean, I was recently in Hawaii and got to eat this fruit called the gak fruit. It's called, it's G-A-C. And it, it's a trip. <laughs> It'll probably be my next one or my next couple of videos, and it's like orange, and you open it up, and the seeds, the seeds were amazing. The seeds look like little stars. They look like a little star, and they're black, and they're kind of thin. They could be totally like a pendant, you know, but I would not waste the seeds to make a pendant out of it because these are, this is so rare. You know, I'd want to plant these guys. But inside, you open it up, and it's just like the darkest, deepest, like, for lack of a better word, blood red color you know, that I've seen, and it's like 70 times more lycopene than tomatoes. Yeah. 10 times more beta-carotene than carrots. I mean, this is one nutritious fruit. The bad part is, it didn't necessarily taste too sweet. It had a pretty much <laughs> nondescript flavor. It didn't really taste like much, actually, but it was like really nutritious. And it was cool that I got to, you know, eat that. It's actually related to the cucumber family. And I mean, I mean, you, and the other thing is, you can't even buy this fruit anywhere because once they're ripe, they get so soft and they will not travel or ship well. 
And then uh, another good food to, that you want to grow are the foods you love the best. Grow the foods that, I mean, some people like, I, I like tomatoes, but I don't like tomatoes nearly as much as I like peppers. So I always grow every year more peppers in my uh, garden than I grow tomatoes. But if you love tomatoes and you have that tomato, you grew up in Italy and you have this certain variety of tomato that you just can't buy anywhere, grow that one by all means because that's what you really like. And I have different likes than other people and stuff, but you would want to experience it. I mean, one of the coolest things is to pick up a seed catalog. If you only get one seed catalog, catalog I recommend you get the one from Baker Creek Seed Company. Their website is rareseeds.com. They have a standard catalog, which is this thick for free, and then if you want to go all out, you can get their little catalog booklet. It's like $7.95. I think they're also selling it on newsstands this year. And it's so thick, and I mean, you could just page through there, and being in people into raw foods, we should all have just the seed catalogs to look through, I mean, especially this one, because it has nice full color pictures. You'd be like, wow, that fruit looks amazing. Those leafy greens look amazing. And you could read all the descriptions and become an expert on, you know, over 1,600 different varieties of fruits and vegetables and plants that they sell at rareseeds.com. How does that compare to the 300, you know, different varieties of things they're selling at Whole Foods, right? They were selling so, that catalog at Whole Foods. So many, oh, they're great. They're selling the rare seeds uh, catalog at Whole Foods, a $7.95 on the thick one. So yeah, grow the foods you love, find the foods you love, and experiment. So how best to grow them? Well, the best way, especially if you're starting, is I recommend a raised bed garden. I'm not really going to get into that in this talk. I have plenty of videos on it. I will recommend a book. It's called Square Foot Gardening by Mel Bartholomew. He really breaks it down really easy, and I've kind of taken what he does and kind of made it better. So if you watch my videos, I have a lot of videos, like an hour-long video where I literally start with a backyard with weeds, you see me weed whacking, then I go around to different stores and figure out which soil I'm going to get, and I probably should have <coughs> made a different choice back then, but I bought that soil, and then, um, you know, it kind of worked, and then I had to, like, dial it in, and then I build the raised bed, I put in the soil, I plant the plants, and I put an irrigation system in all in one hour, and I show you step by step exactly how to do it. And that's the kind of videos that I have for you guys to teach you guys this stuff, even if you've never done it before. So square foot gardening, super simple, super easy. I mean, the easiest thing is you just get a, four pieces of wood. Home Depot will cut it for you if you don't have a table saw at home. You know, like a two by 12 and get four, four pieces and just screw them together or nail them together and just make a box and fill it with some good soil. And then you're, you got a garden, you're ready to plant. I mean, and if you got a lawn, don't dig up your lawn. Just put cardboard over your lawn, build a box on top of that and fill it up the soil on top of that. So that way you don't have to dig or do any extra labor, because I'm all about like, you know, doing the minimal work for the best return. <laughs> the next thing you want to do that you want to pay attention to that's super important is you want to build your soil. Right? I talked about this a little bit earlier. Standard farmers, standard agriculture, you know, they don't work on building their soil. Actually, they work on destroying the soil by putting in, you know, three, you know, uh, water-soluble nutrients, you know, that are derived from uh, petroleum or natural gas that are just, you know, made in a factory. So we want to build, put the organic matter back into the soil to build it up. So whether that's your kitchen, you know, uh, scraps, your com, your composting, the yard waste, the leaves, but not just those things, which are really important. You also want to add things like the trace minerals that I talked about a little bit earlier. They're called rock dusts. A brand name is called Azomite, A-Z-O-M-I-T-E. There's also different sea products that come from the ocean because the the minerals used to be on land, and after the topsoil got devoid of the minerals because they're just washing away and leaching out, all the minerals go to the, the water. Now they take the, the ocean water, they could concentrate that, and then you need to dilute it down to get the salt levels really low, and then you could feed that to your plants. There's a product called C90, also called Ocean Solution, that I use, and I have videos on all of these as well. Um, so yeah, those are the main thing, ways I build my soil, not by adding fertilizers. Even, you know, one of the things that many people are not aware of is that, you know, most even conventional organic, or most organic farming, you know, the main source of their uh, fertilizer is manures. Now, you know, I'm not a big fan of using manures in my garden. I, I, did, I mean, I use a little bit, but I think the amount of manure that they're using in even organic farming is ridiculous because it's just like so much manure nowhere in nature because one of the things I try to live my life by is by modeling nature. If I was out in nature, I'd probably eat a raw diet. I probably wouldn't be cooking and I'd eat a diet primarily of fruits and vegetables. So that's what I try to model in my life. But also in gardening, I try to look at the system. Like how is the forest set up? How would the forest work? Are there big mounds of cow poop in the forest? <laughs> no, man, there's some animals scurrying around. One animal kills another, they eat it. They leave the body to decompose. 
but there's not big mounds of shit in the forest. There's like, you know, the leaves drop their, the trees drop their leaves, the trees fall over, and all that organic matter break down, and there's also insects in there and earthworms producing their insect frass or their insect poop, which is another thing I like to use in my garden. But those are the main source of nutrition for that system, and also the if you think about it, if the, if the soil's fertile and started fertile, the trees are absorbing all the nutrients in its leaves and its, uh, you know, stalks and trunks, and then it's just uh, going back down to the earth, it gets re-put into the soil. But when we have a closed, uh, open loop system like we have, you know, with uh, industrial farming where they're slashing the, the place and then burning it, and now they're just, you know, uh, growing the crops, and then they grow the crops and then they take off the, the foods, right? They're not putting in the nutrients back in that they've already taken out. And so this is a big problem and they keep thinking, oh yeah, I'm just gonna add 15, 15, 15 fertilizer and put back what I've taken out when they're taking out tonnages and they're putting back a fraction of that in, in fertilizers and then not even the proper types of fertilizers. And see, you guys could make more of a realistic system in your home by adding and doing some of the things that I, that I teach about. Another thing I recommend if you're starting to grow food, you need to either start from seed or start from plants. And starting by seeds is far less expensive, starting uh, with plants. The other thing is that with the seeds, you're going to be able to choose a lot more different varieties. If you go to your local nursery or wherever you get your plant starts, they may have only a few different varieties of tomatoes. I mean, every year when I go to buy tomatoes, they may have like, some places, they have 100 varieties of tomatoes, but most places might have 10. But if you go to the seed catalog, there's like probably over like, I don't know, 300, 400 varieties of tomatoes you can select from. But that being said, you know, it's a lot easier, especially if you've never done it before, to buy the starter plants until you get good at it. Because, you know, I'd much rather have somebody have success and, you know, than to maybe it not work out so well and then they not be able to grow food because, oh, my seeds didn't start because I didn't water them enough. It, this wasn't, the soil wasn't right. They weren't getting enough light. They are getting too leggy. Just start off with healthy plants. And, you know, it's better to, far better to grow something than to than grow nothing. And frankly, most of the things that I grow are actually from the starter plants because I can never sit down and plan out the time I'm supposed to plant my seeds in time to have the starter plants that I could plant. And I'm always like, okay, I got to go to this event this week and then now I'm going to Hawaii and two days after this event. And so, but I'm glad that places provide plants and I'll buy them and I'll plant them out so I'll have stuff to eat. <laughs> so the next thing that you really want to do that's important to me is watering. Actually, I'm a bit dehydrated right now, so I'm going to drink some water. But water is very important for your plants. And one thing I really want to teach you guys, and I want you guys to remember, is that nature knows what to do, right? A girl and a guy get together, and they, may, they know how to have babies, right? We don't got to be told how to do this. <laughs> Likewise, you take the seed, you put it in the ground, it gets rained on, the plant knows what to do. It knows how to grow. You need to just stay out of the way. The problem is most gardeners, I want to love my plants. I want to get more water because I love it so much. And then guess what? Then the plant's like, I'm freaking out, man. I'm getting drowned in here. <laughs> right? So yeah, nature knows what to do. We just need to just have enough input to get things going properly. And then, you know, the plants will thrive on their own, right? Just need to set up systems to do this. So that's why I recommend, uh, you know, setting up an irrigation system. If you're even going to have a small raised bed, the irrigation system just takes out some of the guesswork. It'll get watered automatically because you might be traveling. You'll forget to water. Also, it frees you up to do other things in life besides water your garden. And some people love watering their garden. It's like meditative, you know, and I like to water my garden because I could know exactly how much water it needs, you know, and I could see the plants and be the plant whisperer that I am. But <laughs> a lot of times I don't want to deal with that. I just want it to water and then I got to do upload my next video or make a video or do something else traveling somewhere. And then the other thing that's very important with watering is that we want to filter the water. We drink bottled water. I'm drinking bottled water. And, you know, many people just use a city tap water to water their plants. And people don't understand, like, why do we drink bottled water? Well, we don't want the chlorine. We don't want the fluoride. We don't want the VOCs. Well, neither do your plants. And they don't got a choice when you're just watering with the tap water. So you want to get a, a good water filter to at least minimally take out the chlorine. The other thing is I might, you know, I don't want the VOCs either, but... We want to take out the chlorine because the chlorine will really negatively impact the beneficial microbes that are in the soil. And I didn't really even talk about that in this talk. That's a whole other topic that's really important. Just like we need to have probiotics or beneficial microbes in our guts to help us digest our food, the same, our soil is like us. The soil has beneficial microbes, beneficial fungi, beneficial bacteria that basically break down the inorganic matter in the soil and make it bioavailable for the plant to absorb. 
And by using chlorinated water, you may diminish the amount of the microbes that are in there doing the work for you, because they are your workforce that are, you know, making it all happen under the ground. There's a really good uh, movie called, I think it's called Dirt the Movie. And then there's another, I think there's a movie about soil by uh, Garcia. But um, that's advanced topics. But yeah, so we ne need to really work on the soil and filter the water. Finally, how to grow. Everybody always says, John, I'm not growing food, man, because the bugs are going to eat it. Right? You know, every, there's always something that comes up, and there are ways to deal with pests and bugs as they arise. I mean, the number one thing is, I like to say and teach people, is like for us, right? If we eat McDonald's, we're not going to be as healthy as if we eat a balanced, raw foods, fruit and vegetable based diet. Same thing with your plants. If you give your plants miracle crap from the store or just a, you know, a standard fertilizer, they're getting a small spectrum of nutrition. And yeah, they'll grow, but they'll be more prone to getting bugs and diseases and all this kind of stuff because the nature attacks the weakest prey, like you know that lion running after the gazelle. The, the lion's going to go after the slowest gazelle, right? And just take that one down, and the bugs are going to go for the weakest plant. They know how to sense this stuff. I don't know how they know, but they know. And they'll take it out, and some of my plants will be affected, you know, with like aphids or whatnot, and other ones will just laugh them off. And I'm still working on building my soul to get that to happen everywhere, and I'm not quite there yet, but it's a, I'm a work in progress. So we want to build our, uh, the resistance of our plants to bugs and pests by building the soil, number one. And then number two, if you need to, you can always use other controls. So before I do anything, I like to just, if I don't have a big infestation of aphids, and uh, I'll go around and take my fingers and I'll just smush them all, smush all the bugs. Now if you're a true vegan, I don't know, maybe you brush them off and then blow them away or relocate them or something, but I'm not that vegan, right? I mean, if you want to do that, it's cool, I don't got that much time. But <laughs> the other thing I do is I take a, a specially designed bug blaster, it's a hose end nozzle you could take and then you put it on a wand and then it sprays a high pressure water blast. So that kind of just effectively kind of blows them off the plant, and when they get blown off the plant, I don't know what really happens to them, but they usually don't make it back on. <laughs> and then, then if I want to work up levels from there, then I could maybe go to like using some kind of like a neem oil and Dr. Bronner's uh, spray that I use, use to, you know, that I'll take them out, because uh, as a tractin, or there's this property in the neem oil that's toxic uh, to the bugs, which is non-toxic uh, for the most part for us, as long as it's not in super high concentrations. I mean, there's always a way to handle all your gardening challenges in the garden. I don't want that to dissuade you from growing some food. I mean, I don't know how much time I have left. Hopefully I have some time left for some questions and answers for you guys. But hopefully that pretty much told you the story. Number one, why I grow my food, all right? Because I want to live, I almost lost my life. That's why I got into raw foods. I always try to in increase and better what I'm doing, which I also motivate you guys to do. And some of the best foods to grow, obviously the leafy greens, high nutrients, low calories, phytonutrient and phytochemical rich to prevent and help us with uh, having that highest level of health. And how to grow it, easily grow uh, in a little raised bed, start small, get big, grow the sprouts and microgreens in your home as well. And that's pretty much it. I'll take any questions now. Yes? What's the best time to water, and these might be really basic questions, sorry. What's the best time to water, and can you just put like worms into your into your soil? Sure, so the, be the questions are what's the best time to water and uh, can you put worms in your soil? Right. So the best time to water for me is I like to usually water in the in the morning or at night, not in the middle of the heat of the day, and I like to only water the soil, you know, where the where the roots need it and not literally water the plant, because it, especially if you're watering in the middle of the day, it gets hot and the sun could evaporate the water and that's, that could burn the plants actually. Uh, I guess the real answer to the best time to water is I mean, if you, if, if, you, if you see your plants wilting and like they get droopy, like people get sad, they'll be like, Ugh. the time to water is now. Not, and, oh, John said the best time to water is I'm going to wait till nighttime. No, if their plants droopy, water now. It doesn't matter what time of day, but in general, I like to water the night of the day, at, at night or in the morning. And then um, for the worms, yes, you can totally buy the, the right kind of worms, like, uh, you know, composting worms, red wigglers and add them to your soil, and as long as your soil has a nice proper moisture ratio, they'll live in there, and they'll make compost and the worm castings in the soil where they need to be so that you don't actually have to bring in worm castings and add them to your soil because you don't have worms. Yes, yes. Um, what about um, using like ocean water to remineralize your... Oh, at a time? 
So using ocean water to remineralize, I think that's a great idea. I have several episodes on that, and I do need to get out of here. So I need to make one more quick announcement. I do have a few items to sell, um, and that's how I make a living, actually. If you do are going to purchase, purchase a juicer dehydrator, I encourage you to visit my website, discountjuicers.com. And today I brought a few little things that I like to sell when I go to events because I love coconuts. I have a coconut opening tool that basically makes a hole in the Thai coconut so that you can get a straw in there. I also have a coconut demeter, so I love to make a coconut milk, coconut creams to get the meat out of the mature coconut. And I have only three copies of my little booklet that I made, I don't know, eight years ago now with some recipes that I ate at that time. And then I have a one, I only brought one of these, one spiral slicer. This is my favorite spiral slicer that makes the spaghetti pasta out of um, zucchini and it's designed in Germany, so it's a very high quality unit. I'll actually be down by the registration table in the lobby with these items. Uh, my assistant Sandra will probably be selling them. I'll be there and I'll be available to take any questions. If you didn't get your questions answered at this talk, if you want to come by and come chat, I'll probably hang out there for an hour until uh, people don't come by anymore. Thank you. <laughs> All right, this is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. We're here at the 2014 Woodstock Fruit Festival. And uh, what I'll be doing in some of these upcoming videos that I'll be sharing with you guys is I'm gonna be actually interviewing some of the different presenters. Uh